when we think about remote learning experiences, sadly, a lot of times I don't think that we think of joy. Like joy isn't a word that we uh, necessarily have been associating with it because we've been trying to figure out remote learning for weeks, really months by the time that the, this video is, is recorded. <clears throat> and when we bring that element of joy, it can really transform things. It can make learning memorable. And so what if we had remote learning experiences that students wanted to come to, that they wanted to participate in instead of just forcing them, like having them have to participate in them? Well, that's really what we're going to be talking about in this video today. We're creating rem memorable remote learning experiences. And I've got a whole bunch of ideas that I am excited to share with you in this video. So I'm so glad that you're joining us. My name is Matt Miller. I'm the author of Ditch That Textbook and the author of this book that you see right over here, Tech Like a Pirate, which as of the recording of this video is a brand new release. Just came out yesterday, actually, um, and is available for purchase now. And that's really at the heart of this um, book. It, it really works to answer the question that can we use our technology in our classrooms, or in this case, in remote learning, can we use technology to create a memorable experience that students are loving, that students want to participate in? And I think the answer is absolutely yes. And it can also be used to boost learning and push learning forward. And so um, that's really what we're gonna be talking about in this whole presentation. It's kind of, kind of a different one for me because a lot of times I'm doing these live videos and I have guests, but in this case, you've just got me. It's just me this time. So um, if you're joining me live, uh, thank you so much for joining. I would love for you to check in in the chat box. So uh, if you get a chance to type in who you are, where you're from, what you do, that kind of thing, would love to give you a quick shout out on the video. And if you're watching this on the replay, there are lots and lots of resources, lots of ideas that we're gonna get to in this video. Video. And so um, excited to be able to share all of those with you. So, um, so it looks like we've got some folks that are starting to check in. And so that's good. Quick question about the book. When will it be available on the Kindle? I don't know. That's a good question because uh, we've uploaded it to Amazon. We're just waiting for them yet. So um so anyway, for, for those of you that are uh, checking in in the chat, again, I would love to see uh, who you are and where you're from. If you can uh, drop some of those in, uh, this video will be available on YouTube later. So yes, definitely. Um, let's see who is here yet. Yeah, Tracy is excited to see the book. Looking for some people that, here we go. Dawn, good to see Dawn here from Waterloo, Ontario. Katie is here from Ottawa. Um, Ontario. She's back. Loves hearing me talk. Can't wait to get a hold of the book. That's awesome. Good to see you. Rosalina is here from Clovis. She ordered her copy yesterday, which is awesome. Um, Jason is here, South Central Kentucky. Good to see Jason. Um, this is the same Jason I'm thinking of. I think I was on your podcast at some point. So it's good to see a familiar face here. Um, Maria is here from the Chicagoland area. So it's good to see her. Kathy is here from Marion, Ohio. Uh, hello, and it's good to see you. Wow, there's a whole bunch of you here today. Um, Carla's here from North Dakota. Melanie Winstead, a familiar face in these videos, is here, instructional coach from North Carolina. I know it's sold out on Amazon. Everybody keeps telling me, you have no idea how many emails I've gotten from people and how many messages I've gotten. And they're like, hey, hey, Matt, Matt, hey, hey, I, I don't know if you know this, but... Your, your book is sold out on Amazon. <laughs> um, it's not that it's like totally, totally sold out. It's still available. You can go in and still purchase it and they'll send it to you as soon as it's available, which hopefully will be very, very soon. Dalton's here from North Carolina. Good to see him. Ah, Captain Dave, Dave Burgess, my publisher says the Kindle will be up soon. Paperback can be purchased now. So if you're watching this on the replay, I promise we'll get through these real quick. I know that this is probably um, this is probably not like what you tuned in for, but Kristen's here from Jonesboro. It's good to see her. Genevieve from Texas. Oh, there's a whole bunch of you. There's Darby, who a familiar face to me on Twitter. Good to see her. Brian's here from Southern California. My goodness, there's a lot of you here. So I just wanted to say hello to a handful of you that I can throw up here on the screen. So it's good to see 
all of you. And I don't want to waste any more time, not like wasting time. It's not like wasting time to say hi to all of you, but I am ready to get going and to share with you some of the cool stuff that is possible for you to use in your classroom. So I'm going to put my slides back up over here and I'm going to start sharing some stuff with you. And by the way, keep that chat going. If you're watching this live, keep it going because I would love for you to share some of your thoughts and ideas that come along with these things that I'm going to be sharing. So uh, if I put something up there and you're like, oh, I used that in my class already, or oh, this would be really cool, put it in the chat. I'm going to be sharing a bunch of those on the video as we go. So all right, without further ado, creating memorable remote learning experiences. For me, it all started with this book. And you may have noticed that the book that I put up on the original slide, Tech Like a Pirate, whenever people don't know about the pirate titles, I know it can be kind of like, what is this all about? What is this pirate stuff? It started with this for me, Teach Like a Pirate. Um, actually, the author of Teach Like a Pirate, Dave Burgess, just dropped a comment into the video. So I think he's watching. Um, and as I read this book, I got this book in 2013. Actually, I have my original copy of it right here. And you can see it's pretty tattered. It's got coffee stains on it and everything. I did get a signature from Dave Burgess himself on, in the book. But I read this book. And as I was reading it through, there was this one line that just really, really stuck out to me. And it was this. Don't just teach a lesson. Create an experience. And I remember looking at that quote and I was like, wow, that is exactly what I'm looking to do. Not just teach a lesson, but create an experience. And it seemed like every everything that I thought of as I went through the book and in the book, it has all of these hooks, these uh, student engagement hooks, like the life-changing lesson hook and the opportunistic hook and the board message hook and the Picasso hook and all of those. And as I went through these hooks, I kept thinking, oh, I could do this with my technology. Oh, uh, my Chromebooks would be awesome for this. Oh, there's this one app or this one website that I could totally do that with. I kept having these ideas. And I didn't realize it at the time. But when I really started doing that back in 2013, I was brainstorming all of these ideas. I was actually starting to pre-write this book that is now available, Tech Like a Pirate. And I kept pulling together all of these ways that we could use the technology to help create that meaningful experience, that memorable experience. And it helped me to answer this question. This was something that I've wrestled with for the longest time um, when I've been a teacher and even when I do professional development with adults too. And the question is, if class is so forgettable, how do we expect students to remember? You know, we've sat through those forgettable classes before, right? And it's so easy to turn our attention switch to off. And whenever it's off, we might as well be someplace else. And so if we can create that memorable learning, it grabs and holds our students' attention so that they're present in the moment and we remember it and it's fun. And research backs up the, the power of that too. And so that's what I've been looking to do is to create that memorable, memorable learning. And I really believe, I don't know about you, but I really believe that remote learning can be memorable learning too. It can be that kind of engaging learning. And sometimes all it takes is just a little adjustment, just a little infusion of, you know, looking at things from a different perspective or, or whatever. Um, I'm going to share with you some, some ideas on creating that kind of, that kind of a situation. And really it all boils down to this within that book that I was just talking about tech, like a pirate. These are some of the keys that I talk about in the book to create that memorable learning. And when I wrote the book, of course, in my mind, it was blended learning in the classroom. I wasn't thinking about all of the widespread remote learning that's going on right now. But this totally, totally fits uh, when it comes to remote learning too. And so these are the, the eight ways. There's actually seven in the book. That eighth one, storytelling, was actually a chapter that got cut out of the book, but I have that chapter available on my website. I'm going to give you the link to that. You can actually go read that chapter right now. But these are some of the ways that I think that we can create that memorable learning, ways to tech like a pirate. And so um, that's really what we're going to dig into is how does this stuff fit in remote learning? How does it fit in remote learning? So I want to give you about four different ideas that I think really work especially well with remote learning. And again, 
as I share some of these ideas. If you've got your own thoughts or if you've got extra things to add on to it, please, please go ahead and drop that into the chat. Okay. All right. Let's go to the first one. Create and use templates. So I am a huge believer in templates, have used lots and lots of um, lots and lots of templates in my own class and have created a bunch of them for teachers ever since. And I think this is one of the easiest ways to take some of that great learning, put it into one place and then get it out to all of your students. And now templates doesn't necessarily mean worksheets, you know, like drill and kill worksheets, you know, like um, repetitive, tedious, that kind of stuff because we can make some templates that, that look really, really cool. And so I wanna show you an example of some of the ones that I've created that you can actually go and get. And so this was one direction that, that I went when it came to templates and that was, let's use templates in a social media kind of way. What if we framed our lessons around some of the social media that so many of our students absolutely love? And so instead of asking them to write a summary of what they just wrote, what if we write it in the form of a tweet? Instead of trying to recall the important events of something that we've been studying, what if we post them as little mini posts inside of an Instagram story? And see, I looked at all of this social media and I thought, we don't have to have the app to create the experience. Do I have that slide on there? No, I don't. I'll just say it. You don't have to have the app to create the experience. That's really what we're looking for is we want to be able to recreate that experience of the social media, but we don't have to ask our students to download the apps for them. And so these were some of my, uh, some of my favorite examples. I made a TikTok template. Have y'all heard of TikTok? <laughs> I bet you probably have. I bet some of you audibly groaned right after I said that. And so, um, what you can do with the TikTok template is you can have students record a little video and then stick the video inside of that template and it makes it feel like they're doing it for TikTok, which is kind of cool, especially if kids don't have access to the TikTok app. Um, this, the Instagram stories one is really easy. Um, and then up in the top right, you've also got the Snapchat games templates. These are ones that I created too after discovering these on Snapchat. And I thought, oh, these games, could be kind of cool formative assessments, you know, like learning activities. And so I kind of repurpose them into templates. And what you can do with these templates is just download and assign them to your students. In fact, let me show you real fast where you can find them because I've got a link right there. So I've got this huge database of templates, downloadable templates. I made most of them in Google Slides, but just because they're made in Google Slides doesn't mean you can't use them in PowerPoint too. As long as you've got a slide presentation tool, one of those two, you should be able to use these. And so all you do is you just open it up and you make a copy of it. Or if you wanna use it in PowerPoint, all you do is just go to file, download it as a PowerPoint file, and then you assign them out to your students and you can just run with it. So imagine if you took the Instagram stories template and you assigned it out to your students, and you told your students, let's say you're studying something like Romeo and Juliet, and you ask them, what do you think Juliet's Instagram story would look like from act two, scene two? I mean, just think about that as a prompt. Isn't that so cool? Wouldn't you rather answer that question than please write 10 sentences summarizing act two, scene two? Let's make an Instagram story about it. And that shows what they know and it puts it through a whole different, whole different context. So um, anyway, when it comes to all of this stuff, and again, I'm starting to see some, some comments coming in here about some of this. Um, please give me some ideas of if you do something with templates, where if you create something in a document or a slide presentation or something, and you push it out to students and you give them their ability to work within it, let me know what works for you. See, here's part of the reason that I love these templates. Let me flip to this next slide where you can see some actual examples, some actual student examples here. One of the things I love about it is that it gives us a little bit of constraint. You know, there's this talk about think outside the box. You know, um, they say that, you know, we should just totally think outside the box. But the truth is, is that sometimes we want to work within the box. And this kind of gives us the box and it asks us, can we work creatively inside of that box? And so, um, yeah, lots and lots of possibilities here. Uh, you can see 
you know, this is this is an example uh, from a Spanish classroom of st a student working on telling time. My friend Laura Steinbrink uh, provided that one. This one up here, they're doing Instagram stories to show a road trip. And so like, what would it look like if students were on a road trip? And um, so they did this project. I really like this one over here on the right. This one says, um, this one uses the this or that template. And so in this case, they're reading a book and there were these two characters and the teacher put this prompt up here. It said, would, I would like to be book smart like Jesse or I would like to be people smart like Evan. And then the students chose one or the other and then wrote in their reason down below. I mean, isn't that a great prompt? Sometimes I think with these, the the quality of the prompt that goes with it determines the quality of the responses that you get from students sometimes too. All right, let's see what some of the ones are that you're sharing. Uh, Jason says the meme creator via Google Drawings is so much better than trying to use the free online meme creators. Um, tons of inappropriate stuff in the examples. Yep, that's true. If you want to make memes, actually, I think I'm going to touch on this. I think I've got a slide for this later. If you want to make memes in Google Drawings, Google Drawings, by the way, is kind of like a big digital poster board or a big digital piece of paper. That's what Google Drawings is. You can do that by sticking a picture into your Google Drawings and then drawing text boxes over them with white text because that's kind of what a meme looks like. And you just change the font of that text to impact. Impact is the traditional meme font uh, when it comes to... Yeah, when it comes to, to memes, they just use impact and put it in white. And so by doing that, that could that could totally work. So um, Darby thinks she's obsessed. <laughs> I think that's a good thing. And um, who was it that was talking about? Melanie was in on my uh, live video with Holly Clark uh, yesterday talking about templates and PowerPoint. And she said she was going down the rabbit hole of all of the different uh, templates that are available. So um, good stuff. Uh, how about this one? There's another one from Jason. My social studies department used the National Geographic slides template for a variety of purposes. Um, Jason, if you've got a link to that, um, you, you can drop in so that everybody can see. That would be great. Um, I believe there's a, an educator named Ryan O'Donnell from um, California, and he may have a template that looks like the cover of National Geographic that's for free. Um, so you could go check that out. Jennifer says inside the box, the best creative projects often come from dealing with the problems that parameters create for the artist. Interesting. And then trying to figure out how do you deal with those parameters? That's a really interesting thought. Um, Janet Marie says, this all reminds me of the insert gift trend on Instagram right now. Could do a get to know me and gifts about story characters. Yes, yes, absolutely. Love that. And then Patricia's already getting ideas. She says, I already have two ideas to change the slide deck I made this morning. So um, hopefully that's a that's a good thing. You know, hopefully we're not creating more and more work. How are elementary teachers using templates? Third grade teacher here. Uh, you know, with a template, let me show you an example here in just a little bit. I've got an infographic template. I'm going to circle back to this, Kristen. Um, but there's an infographic template that I have that has draggable pieces. I think you may really like that part of it. So we're going to touch on that again in a little bit. So, okay. So those are your templates. And of course, what's great about these is I made most of these in Google Slides or PowerPoint. And so all you do is you just create what you kind of like the frame of where you want students to put their stuff. And then you just share it out with them in your learning management system or whatever. So that's one. Here's number two. Number two is to see video assignments differently. And so I know, especially in remote learning, a lot of people, I'm hearing a lot of people that are doing video assignments on a, on a variety of different tools. Here are some of them. I know Flipgrid is very popular. That's the video response tool where students can record a quick video clip and then their peers can see it if you want to set it that way. And then they're able to leave video replies for each other. Screencastify is another good one to be able to record a screen video. You've got all sorts of options. And so if you're having students record videos as part of remote learning, you know, I think the common thing is we see students, you know, if you look at my little thumbnail over here on the left side of the screen, a lot of times the videos look like this, don't they? I mean, it's head and shoulders straight to the camera, just talking eyeball to eyeball with the camera. And it's just them doing that. And so my question to you is, instead of just doing that, 
what if we could see those videos through a different lens? What's the lens that we can see this activity through? So whenever we see these activities through a different lens, it, it can really change everything and it can change students' motivation to complete the task too. It can make it an experience. So let's imagine that we're studying something in history and that we're, we're going to try to recall some of the facts and some of the events that happened for that one moment in history. So of course we could tell them, Hey, go on to Flipgrid and record a summary of what you remember about that. And they'd go on and they'd be like, I remember that this happened and that this happened and that this happened. And it'd be like monotone and, well, not an experience, right? What if we look at that activity through a different lens? Here's what I mean by that. What if we look at that activity and have them record as if they were a news anchor? So now they're going to sit down at a desk and have their camera pointed at them, and they're going to deliver the information as if they were a news anchor. How about an on-the-scenes TV reporter? You could have them grab their phone and go out in the yard or go someplace and act like they're recording the events as it happens and they're, they're doing a report from the field. Horror movie. Do you all remember the Blair Witch Project? Remember it was this like low budget horror film and <laughs> all of a sudden or you've got these people that are holding up these cameras and they're like trying to record it as if it's an old camcorder. Um, you know, doing it kind of like that where it's raw as if you're, you're kind of making it up on the fly. That could be another lens that you could look through. And then there's even reality game shows. It always makes me think of Cash Cab, you know, Cash Cab where, um, the cab comes and picks somebody up and they don't realize it, but there's a, a TV show host in it and a camera and they're asking questions and, and all of that. Um, that could be another lens you could look at it through is um, recalling that information, trying to, trying to show what they know through the lens of a reality game show. So good stuff when it comes to all of that. Don says, I have them create a video for their maker project from a different perspective, as in one did it as a newscaster. Yes, I love that. By the way, Holly totally remembers the Blair Witch Project. She's like, I'm so scared. Do you remember that part where it's like the person's face is like halfway off the screen and they're looking up like this? I think that's the way it was. I tried to make it in my little slide there if you can, if you can see that. So um, let's see, what else have we got? Kathy says, I showed a historic picture and students became the person in the picture and had to make the video. Boom, love that. That's, that's awesome. Oh no, I think we just spoiled it for Janet Marie. Wait, the Blair Witch wasn't real? I don't know. You're going to have to figure that one out on your own. Maybe it, was, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. I'm not going to say. Don says, my exemplar was as a sportscaster. Had so much fun myself and made a few errors, but left them in. Kids loved it. So creating an example video to show students what's possible. Totally love that. That's, that's awesome. Um, Kristen says, instead of a traditional presentation with slides about his hometown, I helped one of my ESL students create a screencast using Loom and Google Earth. Oh my goodness, that is so cool. If you use Google Earth to be able to see the world from up above, and then use something like Loom to record it and they can voice over it. I totally love that. Oh, this is a good one. I teach secondary ELA. We could have had a masked singer contest using the novel characters as the real person behind the mask. <laughs> Boom, I love this. You all are getting the hang of this lens thing. This is great. This is totally great. One more real fast, or we could create a reality show with the characters in the novel. Imagine the characters of the Crucible as the cast of Jersey Shore. Oh my goodness, Jennifer just went there. You're on fire, Jennifer. I'm loving this. This is great. Okay, so that's that's kind of the thought behind this one. If we're going to use video, what if we can create a different lens that students can look at the activity through? Let's go to number three. Have students create to show what they know. And see, I'm seeing a lot of talk right now in um, remote learning circles talking about the whole cheating issue. They go, but if I make an assignment, how do I, and usually they, they use the words like, how do they, how do I stop or how do I make them? It's like we're forcing things on kids and it's like, how do I make them not cheat? How do I stop them from cheating? And like, is there a tracker software? It's like all of a sudden they want to do all the surveillance. 
Um, is there a way that I can make sure that they're not cheating? And I found that one of the easiest ways to do it is not to have them fill in blanks to answer questions, but have them make something with what they know. So if you make something, you know, that's not something that's Googleable. That's something that you have to conceptualize in your brain and then put onto a screen. So what might that look like? Let me show you a couple of examples. We were just talking about this. There are the memes. See, you all were like a step ahead of me. Um, this is something, like I said earlier, that I created in Google Drawings. You can go to Google Drawings by going to drawings.google.com. It's a normal part of the, the Google G Suite. If you're a Microsoft school, I would just do this in PowerPoint. Just one single PowerPoint slide is going to do what you need it to do. Put a picture down and then draw a couple of text boxes on the top of it. And again, you turn that text box into white text and you change the font to impact and you're, and you're good. And the thing I like about this activity is you have to get the idea across in a short number of words. That's brevity and that's a skill and it's hard. And then if you want to take it a step further, if you want it to be a little bit witty, if you want it to be a little bit funny, that's even harder. And that also requires a deeper understanding of the content. So, um, having students create a meme that is short and funny is really in many ways, high order thinking. So I, I really, really like that as an option. I'll throw this quote in from Dalton. He says, student creation is the best way to tap into their knowledge. Amen, brother, have them show you what they know with creativity. It provides so much more than multiple choice question. So true. Jason says, when teaching mood, we'll have one group create a silent film and another group will have to provide the score for it to try and create a certain mood. Usually get some good stuff on those videos. Oh my goodness. So some one group of students creates the film, the other one creates the score to be able to match the mood to it. Oh, I love that. That's awesome. Jennifer says, we did Montana historic memes just this week. The kids loved it. I bet. Love it. Um, and then Jennifer says, we go above and beyond when we get into creative mode. At least I do. And yeah, I'm the same way. So anyway, that's fun when it comes to memes. How about infographics? This is one that I totally, totally, totally adore. Um, I've been making a lot of infographics since we've been doing remote learning because I felt like that's a really easy, very visual way to get ideas across. And, um, you know, the idea of infographics is just let's mix little bits of text with images. And that whole verbal, visual, images and text thing is very, very brain friendly. And so if you start to think about, instead of having students write an essay or you know record a video where they talk through steps of things, what if you have them make an infographic just as a way to mix things up a little bit? Um, and so when it comes to these infographics, by the way, the ones that I'm showing you on the screen here, all created in Google Drawings which again, you could do with a PowerPoint slide or a Google slide if you're more familiar with those and just do it on a single slide. And so we were talking about third grade earlier. I'm trying to see if I can find the comment up here. No, I'm not gonna look too much longer, but um, anyway. We we're talking about how we're we using uh, templates for third grade. I think that doing some draggable templates like this could totally, totally fit. And so this is a template that I created using Google Slides. Again, you could do this on PowerPoint. I call it an icon board. And it's a really easy way to make an infographic. So imagine if a student is getting ready to do an infographic, the biggest, hardest part of it, well, I shouldn't say the hardest part, but sometimes the most time consuming part is the student finding images. Now, I like to find these icons, by the way, on this website called The Noun Project. It's at thenounproject.com. You can download all of these icons for free. Um, you've just got to attribute the artist and they show you how to do it. So anyway, I was saying the, the most time consuming part is finding the images. So if you could imagine a student like digging and digging and digging through this website, looking and looking and looking for the icon, um, you know, I might walk up to them after 10 minutes and be like, hey, how's the progress on your infographic? And they're like, I've almost got my first icon. And I'm like, that's good. Why don't you just pick one and start moving forward, okay? <laughs> so if you eliminate that, that time drain, 
by providing some icons for them, that could be really helpful. So check out on the screen over here, I'm getting better at my pointing. If you check out on the screen over here, you've got a slide. You see the white part is the slide, right? The gray part around the edge is what I call the workspace. That's the space around the slide. And you know you can put stuff over there, right? It's kind of like a desk. You know, you've got your desktop, and if you've got a piece of paper that, that you're working on, the rest of the desk is for where you put your pencils and your markers and your eraser and all of that stuff. So that's basically what this is. So I've sprinkled all of these icons and little text boxes and lines and shapes and everything all around there so students can just drag them in. And it looks kind of like this when you use it. So you start out with the blank screen. You come over here to the number one. And what I suggest is with any of this stuff, if you want to use it, duplicate it first. So you might click on this number one. And I always use the um, keyboard shortcut control D, which is like command D on a Mac. And that will just duplicate that, that um, item. So if I go control D and then drag that number one over, then I'm going to pull in an icon. So again, I could just duplicate this little uh, light bulb and pull it over. And I'm going to add a text box down below it. And so there's one right there. That could be a step. It could be a list of things. It could be whatever. And so you go on to the next one and you go on and on and on. And then you add a title at the top and boom, you're done. Infographic, just like that. Um, and so when we were talking about third grade, A, you could do something like this. But B, what if you take the draggable part to a different level? So let's say you had some shapes that had some vocabulary words. And then on the screen, you had like little categories and you wanted students to drag those vocabulary words into the little boxes with the different categories. And so having those draggable parts where you drag the word over into the different categories, um, you could use it to label. So you could have the different parts of the water cycle and then bring in a word that kind of points to one of the different parts. Lots of different things um, that you can do with these templates. So Janet Marie says these icon boards are amazing. Thank you for sharing. Even inserting the icons to create a template that can be time consuming for educators. Thanks for eliminating my own time drain. Yes, absolutely. And that's exactly why that's exactly why I did it. So um, yeah, so that's that's another one that we can do. Let's do this one. We got one more here. This is number four. And then I've got a whole bunch of little quick hits for you at the very, very end. And so this one is go on a virtual field trip. Let's get that slide back up real quick. Um, so here's the idea behind this one. Obviously, during remote learning, you know, there are no buses to take us to different places. Um, going on a real field trip maybe isn't going to work out. Well, I say maybe. But a virtual field trip could totally work. And there's a variety of different ways that you can do it. And the first one I want to show you has to do with a tool that you don't even have to log into. This is a tool that you could share your screen on a video call with your students, and you could run it and you could show it to them. Or you could introduce your students to this tool and have them do it themselves. And that tool is Google Maps Street View. One of my absolute favorites, it's super easy to use. And it turns Google Maps into an experience where you are 3D down on the street of just about any place all around the world. So check this out. You grab the little yellow, this will go through several times. So don't worry, you grab the little yellow peg man out of the corner and drop him on the map and this is what shows up. This is an example from Universal Studios um, in Orlando, the theme park. And so what you can do is, once you're dropped down on the street, you can move forward, you can move back. It's almost like you can drive down the street. Notice that it was this little yellow guy that I picked up from over here, dragged him onto the screen. And so um, just imagine the places that you could take your students with this. And all you've got to do to find it is just go to maps.google.com maps.google.com. And then you can take the little yellow peg man just like this out of the corner and drop him onto the screen and it'll put you down on the street if they have images from that. It looks exactly like this on a laptop or a Chromebook. Uh, if you have a mobile device, it's gonna look different. You're gonna need to either download an app or use like Google Maps or something. Now, if you wanna take this to a whole different realm, instead of using Google Maps Street View, you could use Google 
oh, I forgot to show you this. You can go inside of buildings too. On this one, this was Alcatraz. Let me start that over for you real fast. Oh, it'll start over in a second. This is Alcatraz, the prison. And what's neat about this is instead of going here on a on a real field trip, you could do this virtually. And so all you do is you take the little yellow peg man after you found Alcatraz and you drop him inside of this building. This takes you inside the prison. This is a block by the way, and you can click around, you can zoom into the cells if you want to, you can walk down the hallway. And the thing that I think is super cool about this is you can zoom in on these posters. So now it really does feel like a legit honest to goodness virtual field trip. Like you're actually in that place. So by using Google Maps Street View, you can actually drop yourself down inside of some buildings. Don't worry, it's not your house. They don't have they they don't have images of the inside of your house. It's okay. Yet. <laughs> Just kidding. The other one I wanted to show you was Google Earth. Now this is one that is super cool, especially when you turn on 3D mode, as you can see right here. This is an image of Manhattan you know, in New York. And so uh, what you can do with this is you can go from way up in the sky and you can zoom in, zoom in, zoom in until you get closer to the ground. And then you turn on 3D mode. And if you hold in shift and click and drag, it tilts the world kind of like you see in the image right here. I like to call this helicopter view. And talk about creating an experience. If you got to take a helicopter tour of New York City, that's an experience. And so this is something, of course, that you could do while you're on a video call if you wanted, or you could show your students how to do it and have them do it on their own. And so, um, you know, lots of different ways to do these uh, virtual field trips. And it looks like several of you are using something like this too. For instance, Melanie says Google Maps are great for lit trips. Go to a search engine and type in Google Maps lit trips. Isn't that what it's called? Google Maps Lit Trips or Google Earth Lit Trips. And these are kind of like virtual field trips that you can take around a piece of literature, like a book or a novel or something. They are so cool. Ryan says, we took a tour of Pompeii before reading a short story of it and students loved it. Absolutely. Totally, totally love this. Um, Holly says this, which is kind of on the same, same page. She says, we've screen shared the live cams of animals at zoos. And I've even taken my kids in my class on a tour of my garden during the our plant life cycle lesson. That is super cool. That's kind of like a virtual field trip in and of itself, I think. So uh, yeah, absolutely, good stuff. Um, Katie says that she teaches French and we always take a tour of Paris using Google Maps. Yeah, it's, it's super easy and you don't even have to log in or anything. The other thing you can do with this that's cool is if you wanna take it to the next level is that you could have students pull one of these up and then use a screen recording tool. One of my favorites is Screencastify. You can get it at screencastify.com. Um, but there are lots of uh, screen recording tools that you can use. Um, and so all you do is you start recording your screen with one of those and then have them kind of click around like I'm doing in this image. Um, like, and, and then they just act like they're a tour guide. And so they're just taking you on a, a virtual tour, so to speak. So. Yeah, really, really good stuff. Lots of lots of different things that we can do with this. So thank you for sharing all these. These comments have been great, guys. Keep them coming. This is this is fantastic. This is another type of virtual field trip that you can do. If you're already doing video calls with students, what if you had a virtual guest join you? So let's say you do a video call using something like Skype and you invite somebody else, like a, a guest, to be on that Skype call with you. And it could be somebody that you know does work in the kind of content that you're studying, somebody that's a professor or a historian on something that you're trying to study. If you're doing meteorology, reach out to the local meteorologist at the TV station or something. And then there's this, there's skypeintheclassroom.com, which is a great database for finding virtual field trips and virtual guests. Um, and so just inviting people into your class or getting your students signed up for a live virtual field trip and then having all of them join on a video call, that's totally something that we could do during uh, remote learning too. So lots and lots of different things that we can do. Wanted to throw a couple of more of these up about the maps. Scott said, I have had students use Google Earth to track characters' journeys and then document characters' thoughts using a Facebook template. Oh, that's cool. 
That's cool. I love it. And then Jason said, my seventh graders created a my map road trip for Percy Jackson as he went from Montauk to LA. Is that Louisiana? Is that Los Angeles? I don't, I haven't read Percy Jackson. Sorry. Actually, one, one of my daughters was just reading the, the first of the Percy Jackson books and she probably could answer that. But my maps, that's a cool thing too. That takes like a, a map and allows you to drop pins on it. And on each one of those pins, you can give it a title and some information. So imagine being able to drop 10 pins all over a map, 10 different locations about whatever you're studying. And on each one, the student can type some information on it. So now it becomes interactive and they can show you what they, what they know. You can find that at just by searching my maps. It's a Google tool. Um, so that totally works. All right. Janet Marie's excited. <laughs> she says, I'm going to turn my, a travel brochure project for the phantom toll booth into a screencastified Google earth assignment. Yes, that's exactly what you're going to do. I love it. That's great. That's great. Okay. Here's this question. You know, a lot of the things we've been talking about so far are tech like a pirate ideas, you know, using technology to make that learning experience. So then, of course, the question comes up and this is definitely a question. It was Los Angeles. It wasn't Louisiana, just in case you were wondering. The question may come up. What if my students don't have Internet or what if they don't have very solid Internet? I live in a very rem uh, remote, rural part of Indiana. And our internet connection is not very good. In fact, I'm thrilled that it's been as good as it has been on this live video so far. But a lot of the kids in our area don't have good access to internet. And so the question is, what are some alternatives? What are some other things that you could do? And so I started to kind of rack my brain on this and created this infographic. And I think there's lots of things that we could have them do. And of course, several of these could definitely be turned into a um, meaningful, memorable experience. And so let's, let's jump through a couple of these real fast. Let's look at number three, start a passion project. You know, um, people call this genius hour in the schools. This is where we find something that students are passionate about and then let them do an independent project about it and try to connect it to the content standards or maybe not. And, now is a great time to start a passion project. And the neat thing about it is if the students find something they're passionate about and they start that project, we can look at the standards and try to figure out how that project meets the standards. Instead of starting with the standards and saying, what's a project we can do with this? You know, we kind of like flip it around so that the kids get to do what it is that they're passionate about doing. I tell you what, passion is contagious too. Um, We've got other ones like ask someone questions. You know, they probably have adults and maybe siblings uh, in their house, even if they're on a stay at home order um, that they could ask questions of. And so think about what kids could interview their parents about or their grandparents or whatever. Um, since they've got the time, there's a wealth of knowledge and experience in these people's minds. Why not, you know, why not open that up? So. Yeah, lot, lots of possibilities here. By the way, I do have a post on this. If you want to look at all of these a little more in depth, uh, the link is right down here. If you really, if you just go to ditchthattextbook.com and you search for no internet, you're going to be able to find it. So ditchthattextbook.com slash blog. You want to go to the blog part. So there's more good stuff in here. Susan, I caught Susan's comment because Sharon Voss said, go Susan. So Susan says, I'm using my maps to create virtu a virtual field trip of invasive species in science. Oh, that's great. You use the little pins and you drop them into different parts of the map and you show what the invasive species is there. I could totally see that. That's great. Um, Maria says, thank you for providing alternatives to students who don't have internet. This is a big issue. Yes. And I don't think that this is, you know, what you see over here is not the, you know, the final answer to it, but it's at least something to think about, you know, um, Carla says, I worked with a teacher this week to have her students create a map about volcanoes, add a layer to connect the plates. That's cool. I like that. And then one more real quick, um, Bridget says, love my maps. My students made websites modeled after the book Pink is for Blobfish. I've never heard of that book. And used my maps to show the locations of the animals they included on their website. Brilliant. I love that. The map was embedded into the site. This is great. 
Okay, I had to put Irene up here because she's my email buddy from Portugal. And I saw her check in earlier. So I want to say hello to Maria Irene here. And she says, I like the idea of a passion project. I'm going to pass that idea to my colleagues. I think they'll love it. I think so too. It's good to see you. Good to see all of you, you know. Okay, so we've had lots and lots of good stuff here. If you're looking for more, I want to show you a, a really great set of resources that can help you go even further when you're thinking about making remote learning memorable, you know, turning it into that experience. And so, first of all, there is this book. It's called Tech Like a Pirate, and I wrote it. Um, it's brand new. And in this book, you're going to get, you know, tons of ideas, just like the ones that I showed you. What I showed you in this video today is just sort of a snippet of what's in the book. We've got even more downloadable templates that you can grab. Um, we've got seven new pirate hooks. If you're familiar with Teach Like a Pirate, you know that there are hooks, you know, ways to engage students all throughout. I got permission from the pirate captain, Dave Burgess himself to make new hooks. So there are seven new hooks in my book. I've got stories from my very own classroom. I kind of like take you into my classroom uh, with some of the experiences I had. There's in the spotlight examples where I'll take a specific example, like the Instagram stories um, template that I showed you earlier. This is one of those in the spotlight examples. We take one and we do a deep dive in exactly how it works. We've got the tech treasure trove lists which are lists of lots of ideas and tools that you can use. And then there's even the Maverick teacher pledge. I'll just let you figure that one out if you, if you get the book, but that one, that's a, that's a pretty cool thing too. Now, in addition to the book, the book has a companion website, which you can see right down here at the bottom of the slide at techlikeapirate.com. Oh, before we get to the website, I wanted to share this with you. This is kind of a taste of what's in the book. There's some of those uh, quotes. We saw this one earlier. Um, here's another one. Fun doesn't stand in the way of learning. On the contrary, it is the path to the learning of our dreams. Memorable learning that's an experience. This is a lot of what the book is all about here. Now, like I was saying earlier, there's this website. If you go to techlikeapirate.com techlikeapirate.com. It takes you to this page right over here. And what I've got there is a collection of resources, meaning blog posts, videos, um, conference presentations, podcast episodes, how to's, all sorts of things like that. And they're all grouped around those original eight things. So you remember the eight ways to tech like a pirate that you saw at the beginning? Those yellow buttons right there will take you to resources for each one of them. I've written blog posts and created resources on each one of those eight, and I've linked to all of them right there. Guess how much that website costs you to access? It's free. It's totally free. So if you're excited about the idea of the book, of making learning memorable with technology, you can go right to techlikeapirate.com and you can start checking out a bunch of those um, free resources. But again, of course, if you're interested in checking out the book, um, I would love to have you do that. In fact, um, I'm going to try. Wow, I should have had this pulled up already. I'm going to take a look real fast at there's the book right there. So I want to show you real fast live here that it does show that the paperback is available. And it says right now, again, if you're watching this live, this is just what it says right now. It says temporarily out of stock, which is so weird because Amazon is the one that prints the books and they're the ones that are saying that it's out of stock. So I think this has got to be a glitch on their side. So um, if you're interested in getting one, definitely go grab a copy of the paperback right here. I would buy the one that says prime, even if you don't have prime, because then you're getting it from Amazon, you get a better experience all the way around. But it is available if you're interested in going and checking it out. So to kind of wrap this up real quick, again, uh, techlikeapirate.com is the, the place where you can find um, all of that free stuff, all of the free resources. There's also a link to buy the book if you want to. But honestly, even if you don't buy the book, there's still lots of good stuff to get you to dive into this and dig into it. So I hope you had a good time. Judging from some of the comments, I see that some of you have already um, 
appreciated what, what was shared in the video today, which is awesome. That, that thrills me to, to see that. So thank you so much for joining. If you haven't already, please do click that subscribe button on YouTube. If you're watching on YouTube, hit subscribe and hit the little bell next to it. So you get notifications of other live videos like this. If you're interested in getting more of them, I'm also over on Facebook at facebook.com slash ditch that textbook, which may be where you're seeing this right now. And so, um, if you like following things on Facebook, then I'm over there too. So, um, definitely go check that out. All right. I hope that you're doing well. I hope that remote learning is going well for you. I hope that just learning in general is going well for you and your students. And I hope that this has helped and I appreciate you joining and I'll see you on the next video. Take care.